You know, when it comes to adventure, I, I just kind of feel like that's just a way of living. It's all relative, you know, one person's adventure could be another person's holiday, you know. For me, just, you know, going into the unknown and then eventually knowing is, uh, is a pretty gratifying thing. And it's, it's exhilarating and uh, makes you really feel alive. I knew this trip was gonna be pretty hard for a number of reasons. All, the cast of characters involved, Andrew McNabb, he's a full mountain man from Revelstoke. These mountains are in his backyard and I knew he was gonna choose quite a challenging route. That's great. The energy in this valley is, is pretty unique, I feel. You gotta want it to get shit done around here. Like, the bush is thick, things are hard. This river is the main vein that runs through like the whole Pacific Northwest. Columbia's power, and we're in the beginning of it. And from my opinion, Andrew's probably one of the fastest moving people in the mountains in Canada. He's probably able to get to the top of a mountain and down to the bottom before really anybody else. And like in, in the summer for the past few years, I've been trying to do more mountain moving kind of way and um, been doing lots of traverses of alpine climbing and running or mountain running kind of thing and mixing that. But I've always daydreamed of like of the bike traverse. And I really like staring at Google Earth and, and daydreaming of lines like, I want to run this and link that. It's like, yeah, I mean, 20, it's about 130, 150 clicks. You could probably do that 25K a day. I mean, like, you should be able to hike 25 kilometers a day. And... No, no, I, I knew that uh, McNabb had gone through the Google Earth and uh, planned out this route and um, said there was going to be lots of walking. There was a lot of walking. This will be like the testament to see if we can really do like a, a ski traverse style on bikes. More than any other bike packing mission I've ever done, this was done with a pure backcountry skiing ethos. There was no trail. You're literally just going straight up ridge lines, straight down the other side. Yeah, total shit show. Uh, <laughs> going up that fire road and everything, I, I was just looking around at everyone. I think everyone was going through their mental checklist. Did we get this? Did we get that? You know, I've, I've been doing these types of trips in the past 25 years, and I felt more anxiety over this one than most trips I've done. And I think the main reason was I'd come from a, like a 43-hour flight from South Africa, arrived in Revelstoke, and they're like, we're setting off first thing in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, just skip that little camp just up there. Nice long ridge line to cruise down, which would give us a good vantage of like, oh, that sounds insane. Is this shit really doable? <laughs> well, we're really doing it. Oh, we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. You know, in the end, we had everything we needed. Our stoves didn't work which added to the adventure. You know, even though we knew we were, you know, the temperatures were gonna be really cold and it would be a lot easier with the stove and some hot water and stuff like that, we're like, ah, we're gonna get through it. It's actually not that bad. It's still got the spice, like. I was born ready, man. I was born ready to get cold and stay cold. I'm gonna enjoy it while it lasts. I'm gonna get up to the top of that ridge line and see what lies ahead. We, have, we really have no concrete idea of what we're gonna encounter, but we'll find out in a few hours. I've never had my bike on my back for as consistently long as I did going through the most convoluted terrain. Like normally you toss your bike on your back and you got a steep section or there's you know some, some stuff to get through and this was, well you toss your bike on your back for four hours because you're climbing from this lake up to that ridge top and it's basically just strewn with boulders. Journey to about five kilometers from, uh, well, from where we camped, which is like a couple.
couple kilometers past Quartz Lake. Finally get into the uh, the alpine part of it. We we're actually on a ridge and hopefully can ride our bikes a lot more than we've been carrying them. Done that. Most of it from the rock there. Big rock built in the middle, and then I stopped, and then I fucking wiped out down here. Yeah, here we are, close to the end of day two, and we've gotten to the campsite we had keyed up on the map for uh, day one. But uh, yeah, we're here. We're here now. So we just hiked a biked up this whole ridge and poked our way down here, and I would say like 80% of it was rideable, and 30% of it was really good and 10% of it was snow and that was really fun too. <laughs> right. Hardest day of riding that really puts into perspective how awesome those couple sections we rode are. You know these things are all about getting the whole team through intact and a team is only as fast as its slowest member. How'd it go out there? It's all right. <laughs> this river crossing. Yeah. We quickly found out once we started the traverse that uh, things on a 13 inch monitor are kind of deceiving. The real life is a lot bigger. The rideability should increase more as we get in to a certain extent, I think. I think your plan just like try to cover as much ground and still film as much as we can. Google Earth can make you think you can do a whole bunch of shit, but I mean, that sandbagged me many times in my life. It's doing it right now as well. Like, I'm like, it's impossible to actually keep up. I think it's more of an ego thing just to be like the, the humility of being on a trip where you're actually the slowest person. Um, it's a character builder, you know? This should have been our first climb day two. We're only a day behind and 20 kilometers back. Judging by the train we've been through, we will not be hauling ass through here. Fucking A. I think it's easier than yesterday, except I'm more tired. So I'm like, net zero benefit. I bet McNabb rode this. As a team, we stay as a team. Like, that's the strength. We're not, no one's bailing on their own. Even the, that safety thing aside. Oh, well, I don't know. On, the, on these things, I'm like a good like a half hour behind. Well, part of it was like, if you stand a good chance of like getting, like completing the traverse, it's like, the weak links holding holding them back. And he's kind of unknown on the other sides of these. It's just unsafe. That's a whole lot of risk. I mean, first of all, I've never ever, ever, ever actually bailed on a trip before.
if uh, cutting this early was the decision that we wanted to make, if we could end up, ideally end up like riding out down into Golden, because then at least we've connected, like we've started at Quartz Creek, and now we've like gone into Golden. We had a group chat about it. I expressed my concern about it. And then we're like, well, let's just get closer and look at it. Got closer and looked at it. Still looked pretty scary. And we got even closer and looked at it. Still looked pretty scary. And then we, by the time we got underneath it, we realized, oh, you know, it's steep, but it's totally manageable. And it turned out to be one of the, one of the easiest climbs of the whole trip. So I think it just goes to show that sometimes like, the psychology of these trips, you can freak yourself out. If you overanalyze things, you can make them more than what they actually are. But we're lucky we you know, made the group decision to go over that pass because then on the other side of it was the, the sickest descent of the whole trip without question. passes today. Lots of great riding on the way out of both of them. The second one in particular, like that was exactly what we were coming here to look for was like pieces that you could just drop in and ride. It was just a blast. In an instant, our plans changed. We we're just at Mother Nature's mercy. This is his day four. I think we're about a day outside of Golden. Looks like it just dumped some snow on us this morning. Woke up to a nice layer of snow. That uh, makes it extra palatable for the uh, Quaker oatmeal with uh, cold water. It'll, uh, yeah, it'll make things from here on out pretty interesting. Whichever direction we go. So we're at a bit of a decision point here. Uh, decision one would be to head on up to the ridge that even if you pointed the camera over there, you wouldn't be able to see because it's foggy and snowy. Decision two is to follow this little trail that we found and see where it goes. Tree! We don't look super responsible in terms of decision making in the mountains if like, head up into unknown alpine terrain in a blizzard. Like this will be a, an adventure. I walked a little ways along it there and it, it doesn't really go anywhere. Oh, well, it goes, but it doesn't get any better. Five, <laughs> 10 centimeters of snow and not being able to see the rocks. That's... It puts a lot of pressure to try to make sure that you're moving as quickly as you actually can without getting hurt. And, uh, but there's a lot of obstacles in these mountains and you don't want to be, you know, just turning your ankle or getting it trapped in between some of these rocks could mean a debilitating injury that you would be hard pressed to walk out. It's the most fucked up thing I've done on a bicycle. Yeah, well we had a little blip in our trip where we had to, uh, we basically got snowed off a mountain uh, down a pass which we weren't planning on going down and we weren't sure if there was a trail and uh, lo and behold there wasn't a trail so we spent i don't know six to eight hours bashing our way out onto a logging road what the fuck? Uh, and then bryce our uh, writer for the trip he injured his knee on that on the last day out uh, so he basically had to pull out 
you can't win them all. You know, every now and again you're going to get hurt. I don't even know what happened. I stretched slash tore my meniscus, my MCL, my ACL, and probably the top part of my calf muscle. I just realized, oh, my knee is really swollen. It was like pushing against my knee pad, and like I'm actually hurt. We had an unexpected three-day stop in, uh, in Golden to kind of recollect ourselves and figure out what we're going to do next and uh, basically wait for the weather to clear again. Um, it snowed a couple of days up there and we were prepared for it and uh, we went back in and I don't know what happened but the snow was there. No one really cared because the riding was out of this world. And then we decided to, to go back in and keep going because, I mean, with the weather got better and the, and the desire to be out there had never changed. So we tried even though there was snow on the ground and went back in to like do the south end of the Dogtooth Range and head north. It was really cool to see the culmination of everything that we had tried to do. You know, we we had our we had our route and we had some zones sort of picked out that we that we thought we could ride and lo and behold it was some of the best riding I've, I've probably ever done in my life. And it was proving our concept of ski touring applied to mountain biking. really humbling just to realize that you're in this kind of unforgiving landscape. You realize that as a human, you're just this insignificant speck of protoplasm. Compared to the mountains, the mountains are everything. We're just little pieces of shit. And you realize that, and that's one of the things I love most about being in big mountains and why it always gets me grounded again. Yeah, and now we're here at this sweet spot. We got like six kilometers left or so to get to a 12 mile basin kind of area. And, and uh, from there, we'll, we can rally down the trail and head back to the truck. Nice little three day traverse. Yeah, the last day uh, to basically pop out on the last ridge we needed to get over, we, we got some exposure. Um, Kind of a, not, not much of a climbing move, you know, maybe like 5'4 or just like serious scrambling move, but the exposure was so great that if you fall, you probably die. And lo and behold, I was the guy that kind of froze halfway up because I had a piece of choss and it came loose and I just lost my shit. Probably the scariest part of the trip for me, but everyone else did it. Like, what are you going to do, not go? <laughs> 
I mean, by the end of this, that trips, we would have had like, you know, two thirds of that range covered. And, and it's wicked because then you're figuring it out and just leaves this random part in the middle to, to figure out. And it's like, wow, what better carrot? And this sweet looking piece that you just get to look at. It's like, this trip, I think it's opened up a whole new world for us. Um, we just, I think we just figured out that you don't actually need a trail to go mountain biking anywhere, really. Um, and I think the ground that we covered um, proves that. We can go anywhere now. <laughs> that's us. The cat's ass route. The fact that we did it just shows what you can actually do on your bike. Um, you can approach mountains in the same way you would on skis in the middle of the winter it kind of shows that there's there are few limits on what you can actually do you know and i think some of the other guys on the team are like what's next like what how are we going to up the ante on this one <laughs> <laughs>